Okay. Alrighty, ready? Yep. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, Alexa. Okay. Hey guys, welcome to season five, episode three of the For the Generation podcast. Welcome back to our listeners, and if you're new, welcome to our podcast. We're your hosts, Natalia Velasco and Alexa Gomez, and today we're doing the first episode of our first gen spotlight at LMU series. Yay. So we have Sean Ryan Peterson, who is a senior majoring in English at Loyola Marymount University. Currently at LMU, he is on eboard for the LMU Kodai? Kodai. Kodai Club. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, he has voiced Chadley on the Final Fantasy VII remake, and he also voices Valentino on Cartoon Network's Victor and Valentino. He also has other projects that he cannot disclose with us yet. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We're so excited to have you. Um, do you have anything else to add for the viewers? Um, actually, uh, I am on a new Apple TV show called Interrupting Chicken that Ooh. premieres on November 18th. I was oh, only recently soon. able to announce that one, so yes. That's Yay. so exciting. All right, so to start us off, how did you choose your major? Um, I had actually originally come to a Loyola to study psychology. It was something mm. I had an interest in, uh, and it was also s I didn't want to come in major list. I'm sure some of you can understand that struggle. Yeah, definitely. Um, eventually, though, I kind of uh, not fell out of love with psychology, but I, I found that I really enjoyed the writing part more than like the statistics mm. and the mathematical oh, yeah. research <laughs> part of it. So I'm like, okay, I know I like writing. I can tolerate research for academic sense. So I think I'll switch to English major, and you know see if I can focus and take classes that focus on creative writing for fiction, Ooh. which is what my specialization is. That's super nice. Yeah, I'm in stats right now for psych. Very difficult. Yes, I do yeah. remember his stats. That was a fun class. <laughs> it's crazy. So how long did you stick with the psychology major? I was technically a psych major for all of freshmen, all of sophomore, and the first semester of junior. But by the time I was taking that last semester of junior before I made the switch, I was actually already taking like journalism oh, courses okay. and like miscellaneous uh, general flag. Mm -hmm. So pretty much by junior second semester, I was full blown English major, but I oh. finished all my course. So I'm just taking uh, English courses all the way. Oh, that's oh, super yeah. nice. Um, so how does your major tie in with voice acting? Well, creative fiction writing yeah. is something that can also translate to screenwriting. Yeah. Um, I didn't have the chance to switch over to SFTV, but I very much enjoy it. And I, I'm actually studying how to use certain screenwriting programs on the mm. side. And I hope that Ooh. maybe if I write a book one day, I can make it into a script and then pitch it to Ooh. a studio. Oh, that's super cool. So do you feel like you would have wanted to do screenwriting over English or? What I'm not think? sure. I definitely think there's a lot of pros to sticking in the liberal college mm -hmm. and that in also another sense the English major is a little more versatile right um to all of my struggling college students out there listening <laughs> to this a degree in any field is useful I know maybe you might think that it might not be but I assure you just saying that you have a degree <laughs> from an accredited university will get you a job yeah maybe not in the field you want but it will get you a job yeah. so hold on to those expensive pieces of paper everyone yeah. oh yeah um well, I feel like that kind of goes with like this whole idea of like first gen. Like, um, so how has your first gen identity kind of impacted your college experience? And like, did it have anything with you like I guess switching from so psychology to um, English? Like, how did that go? It came with its own pros and cons in a sense. You know, I came like many first gen students to college knowing absolutely nothing. Right. There's still things I discover about LMU every day in mm. the facilities it offers. Something I definitely feel like that could be improved upon. I, I think people need to tell their students a little bit better, either the directories to where they can find the information or mm. just telling them out right. Um, I also feel like some of the pros though was like everything's been very enjoyable. Everything's new. No one told me what to expect. Yeah, yeah. No one could tell me in any definitive way, this is how it's going to be. Or uh -huh. at the same sense, how I guess I was a little extra nervous about switching major because I was like, oh, is that a bad thing? Do people <laughs> switch majors? Yeah. I thought you're supposed to just stick with it, even if you hate it at a certain point, just yeah. get the degree in it. But I'm like, no, it's, you know, it's learning in a very special kind of sense. It's you get over things and you learn things that no one can really verbally tell you. Right. I even feel like families who've gone to college for generations can't perfectly explain to their son or daughter or their they them all my non-binary pals what they could expect going into college right. and that's what i think is also special about the first gen experience because now you also have that knowledge you can uh 
tell future generations, mm-hmm. your own kids. Yeah. And if not, true. then you can just tell them, buckle up, son. It's going to be a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think your first gen um, identity impacts your career at all? Your voice acting? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I am the first gen in my family to kind of go into the voiceover industry in a right. sense. Um, I'm definitely going to offer that to my kids. I think it's a great industry yeah. and I would love for them to explore that creative side of them. Um, and if they don't like it, then that's okay. <laughs> so how, uh, how did you originally get into voice acting? Um, my mom was actually a dancer for a couple oh. shows back in the day. Um, so when I was watching TV, I was about like eight year old, eight years old. I think it was Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, Digimon. I really only watched animated shows growing (laughs) up. I was like, you know what? I want to be a voice on TV. Um, I just thought it was cool at the time. Honestly, it's not like I had any deep thoughts about it. I'm like money, yada, 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 whatever. I just thought it'd be cool Mm -hmm. to brag to my friends that I voice Pokemon or something. (laughs) Yeah. Like. I'm actually on your favorite TV yeah, show. No, you know that sh- you, watch you hear that, that voice? Like, yeah, that's did you me. really enjoy that episode, that character? Did you say he's your favorite? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually me. me. <laughs> that's actually me. I know, kind of a boss or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I sort of just got into it, and really just because I thought I was really interested in it, but I sort of discovered a passion for it. Mm-hmm. I've been doing it for 14 years, and I'm not going to oh, pretend wow. like all 14 oh, wow. of those years I was sure of it. Like, yes, yeah. this is what I want to stick with for the rest of my life. There were ups right. and downs. There were uh, dry patches where I was like submitting for auditions and nothing was coming through no news no feedback no nothing mm-hmm. and you know I was questioning like do I really want to keep doing this do I want to buckle down and start focusing on something else but I stuck with it um, got my new agent Melissa Berger Brennan at CSD and she's been fantastic so far helping me uh, pitch my voice to a bunch of different companies to get jobs and I, I've just I've loved it ever since and I'm gonna stick with it till the day I die that's or super cool. I'm no longer able to speak words. <laughs> How does like the like agent work? Like, do, do they like tell you like, oh, this new show needs stuff? Kinda. I, I wish it was a little more personal like that, <laughs> but I understand that at this point, agents have thousands of clients underneath mm. them. Oh, so yeah. it's more like a giant email list. Like, imagine you receive an email from from a club saying meeting tonight. That that's kind of what like oh, it is. Uh-huh. Casting calls where they just send out an email saying project name always fake never the real project name you're never supposed to know what you're going out for um here's a role here's a role here's a role uh this role is for a caucasian uh 13 to 15 uh adults to play younger or uh this one's uh 8 to 10 we want real kids for this one Mm -hmm. uh this one female but non-binary as well you know just like those those are how you receive them you receive a character name their ethnicity, their their gender identification, if any, uh, age range, whether they want legal 18 or actual 18 plus mm-hmm. to play them, and then a character description, like a breakdown. Mm-hmm. Okay. So has there ever been a project where like you get an email and then you get it and then you're like, oh, it's actually that? Because you said they don't <laughs> like tell you what it actually is. I feel like I'm a little special in that regard, and that's not because of anything <laughs> talent-wise. I'm a huge nerd. I play an absurd amount of video games. I watch an absurd (laughs) amount of anime. So by reading words in it, like I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's a very specific reference that has no other place it appears except in this game I played. I'm like, oh, I'm able to recognize this. Actually, even when I auditioned for Chadley, I'm like, okay, these words are a little too specific to only one series that it could be from. So you can kind of like pin it out. Yeah. Figure it out. I think that's a special advantage in my own regard because once you know what something's from, you can kind of like watch or read or consume that media to be like, ah, this is the vibe. This is how all these other actors are playing these characters in a very certain way, certain tone. So I can match that for my read. Uh I'm just completely flying blind. But that's only because... All of my free time outside of voice acting is school spent consuming <laughs> anime yeah. and video games. Yeah. So I know most of it's like animated and stuff, but like, have you ever thought about like singing for characters? <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> and I, I do receive breakdowns occasionally where they ask for singing. Um, let's just say I'm taking lessons. <laughs> oh my gosh, actually? So do they like That's make you? Cool. Yeah. Do they make you like sing on the spot? No, well, all this is recorded and sent in, so kind of technically on the spot. Sometimes Uh they'll send you, like, original songs, so they'll just ask you to sing a chorus from some popular song at the time. Uh And I have to be very selective with it because (laughs) it's difficult. Normally, you have to have, like, a character voice, and then you have to sing in that character voice. So not only do you have to learn how to sing, you have to be able to modify that singing to match certain characters, which also 
even if you yeah. just can't change your voice, your singing voice to that degree, at the end of the day, you're just gonna <laughs> read for one type of character oh and my. only sing for one type of character. <laughs> yeah. What about like actual like acting? Like, what you think about like not doing like characters maybe, but like yourself as an act actor? There are definitely times when characters I've auditioned for were basically just me pitched up. Mm. Like Valentino, he's pretty much me as a kid. He's that uh, schmarmy know-it-all, even if he's wrong, he'll <laughs> die on the hill that he's right sort of kid. <laughs> um screaming high pitch like it was always a joke on set that uh, with every episode written we become one <laughs> as, as basically my own sense of humor started to bleed into the way the character was written by the by the uh, storyboard artists mm -hmm. which we were a special show in that regard storyboard artists in conjunction with screenwriters were the ones who were actually writing the scripts for the show right. which is actually a very unique creation process for victor and valentino uh, i haven't done another project that was ever like that to be honest but yeah there are times when i look at a character breakdown like oh this is just me either deeper or higher pitched or my normal voice uh, do you feel like it was easier for you to voice him because you resonated with the character more or i think it certainly became easier over time i'm not gonna die uh, i was a little nervous uh -huh. um i had been coming out of a dry spell so I hadn't done a, uh, a job for a while, so I'm like, okay, this is a job. It's an ensemble cast, which means I'm in a room full of experienced voice actors. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I just hope I don't fumble the bag. <laughs> so you filmed with a bunch of other people. You're they yeah, we were all we were in a booth, up to five of us at a time, sometimes oh, wow. more, and we would just like share mics. It was actually oh. really fun. I, I, in another sense, I've never done another job like that as well. Uh, it blew me away because of the kind of people we brought onto that show. These people like voiced my childhood. I, oh, I worked wow. with Tom Kenny. He came on the show. He's SpongeBob. Oh my gosh. Um, oh, wow. D. Bradley Baker. He king of monsters and creatures. I'm pretty sure there's less shows without his name on them than there are more. Wow. Uh, there have just been so many people that came through that door that I'm honored to have worked with, and like they blew me away, and I fanboyed in front of them. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> Would they ever, like, do the voices for the characters you knew for you? I mean, <laughs> I was so bad asking him to do that. But there were times I'm like, hey, can you, um, <clears throat> if it's not, like, too weird, or anything, <laughs> just, like, do this voice? And they're like, yeah, all right, sure. And I'm like, oh. When, like, these people talk, would you be able to, like, figure out, like, oh, you're SpongeBob? Like, oh, will yeah. you hear it in their Instantly. voice? I didn't even have to Google their names. Like, ah, yes, I know who this is. Yeah, that's um, him. There were definitely times, though, where, where I would still Google them anyways and be just surprised at just how many people mm -hmm. these guys have played, these guys and gals have played uh -huh. from my childhood. I'm like, oh, wow, I played that game literally last week, and here you are in front of me now. That is crazy. It was, it, it, I, I, I think there is situations where you can meet your heroes, and I, I definitely don't think that – such a jaded take to say never meet your heroes. I'm like, no, no. People can be good too, and they can yeah. be fantastic and talented and respectable individuals in your career path, and, you know – I've learned a lot from just being in the same room as them. Is the voice acting industry small because these people play so many characters or what would you say? I'd say small is extremely subjective. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel like once you established your name and you start working for multiple companies and these and you you've met a bunch of casting directors who are like, "Yes, I know what this person's capable of," uh -huh. and therefore I'm going to skip the casting process and just say I'll book this person because I know they can do this character. Right. So in that sense, it's small that the most well-known names are a small handful. Uh -huh. um, especially when you start breaking up archetypes like, oh, creatures, there are like three extraordinarily well-known creature voice actors that you'd call upon. Uh -huh. Or like, oh, rough tomboy soldier. There's like certain actresses who easily play that archetype and that they're called upon immediately. Especially for anime dubbing, Anime dubbing rarely sees a ton of auditions for them. From what I've heard, it's a very tight-knit community once you break into it. And those people in those circles start knowing your name. They're like, okay, instead of casting, you know, like I said, just skip the process yeah. and call that person in. Uh -huh. But there are a lot of aspiring voice actors. Um, there are a lot of people who just haven't had their chance to get their break yet. And, you know, for a while, I was one of them. So, you know, like, I know I know what it feels like. Uh -huh. And even though it's small, they all treat each other with such an insane level of, like, mutual respect and kindness and like mentorship to one another because everyone's done something that no one else has, has before uh -huh. that it's just like it's really chill so it's not like a super even though you are literally competing with someone for that role it's right. not necessarily competitive in the oh when you shake their hands you wish upon their downfall type <laughs> right. of vibe yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so could you explain a little bit more about like the process that you like go during like recording for like auditions or work 
work. Uh, work, yeah. For work. Well, I usually listen to my audition tape for the character if mm -hmm. that's what got me the job. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes I do an audition and it was so wildly different from what they ended up having me do once I got in the booth. Mm -hmm. Like when I first auditioned for Chadley from Final Fantasy VII, uh, it was an extremely strange circumstance because I had later learned that uh, I was booked off a British accent, which the oh. character does not have. <laughs> so I thought that was absolutely hilarious, which is why I'm like, ah, yes, I can't use my audition as a reference for going into work because yeah. that's so far off the cuff of what they actually hired me to do. Um, but they just heard that I was able to hit those youthful pitches that they wanted for the characters. So that's why they ended up hiring me for it, despite huh. the fact that I submitted an extremely strange audition. <laughs> <laughs> so you did a British accent for that one? I did. I did a British accent for that one. It was actually... Um, <laughs> Last year, we would like do British accents, but we would like very break into often, them. <laughs> very just break often. into them at random. <laughs> We're not very good no. at it. Um, <laughs> no. Except um, Chadley was a little more higher pitched, very smarmy, very intelligent. Um, that's crazy. He would sort of speak with this know-it-all attitude, but it was so kind with such a smile that no one would ever like hate him for it. It was interesting. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's not what they wanted when I walked into the booth. I'm like, all right, guys, I'm here to do my job. I'm like, no, 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 drop, drop, oh, drop, oh, drop oh, that. Take that off, take drop that, off. drop that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So how long are like your hours? Like when they're like, okay, you're coming in today. How long are you working? Typically sessions are about four hours. Oh, wow. Nine to one, three to seven, six to 10. Um, for, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, six to 10 is pretty late. Uh, especially when I have to drive back from Burbank, which is usually where I record my sessions. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's usually four hour segments though throughout the day. It entirely depends on the studio. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes, uh, studios are like, we really need to bang this out. So I'm going to have you stay for like six hours. Oh jeez. And I'm like, Oh, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a limit to how long they can keep you on set, not just by law, but by like a, a sort of sentiment of like, yeah, your voice is probably going to start giving out by hour mm. four. Oh, <laughs> Maybe yeah. we should just let you go. Cause these next two hours might have like next to null usable tape. So yeah. So how was the process like how long were you recording for the Victor and Valentino? Like we were recording that? for several years, um, but we were doing four hour sessions for that as well. Okay. Normally in the morning, though. Um, so I was going in at like nine, nine to one. Mm -hmm. Those were typically my hours for Victor and Valentino, although it became a lot more sporadic and all over the place during, well, COVID, right, the, right. the great black plague of 2020 <laughs> and 2021. Do you like take breaks in between like filming like these four hour sessions or is it just like straight up you like You're talking in the, the whole time? We have like five minute breaks, mm -hmm. 10 minute breaks. Um, for Chadley, it's a little more arduous in the long term because his lines are very eloquent and use big multiple syllable words. <laughs> really putting my English major to use there. See crossover between there career and my major. Yeah. I'm like, I know what these words mean and how they should sound. <laughs> See degree degree being put to use, everyone. I'm I'm proof in the pudding. Um <laughs> So we take like 30 minute breaks for Chadley um, okay. as well, because also like my booth director and my, my engineer, those guys have been there since like six in the morning doing sessions. Oh, wow. And they were going to be staying long after I leave at like seven or 10 to, to like clean up and double check the reads. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? You guys take your 30 minute breaks. You need it more than I do. Oh yeah, that's crazy. So how was voice acting during COVID? Like, how was that for you? It was a godsend, mostly. Um, it was nice to still be able to work and talk to the people that I loved working with, even though it saddened me that it was over a Zoom interface. Uh -huh. Didn't always get to see their faces. Sometimes their cameras didn't work, or sometimes they had to leave right away or just record their lines and go, where normally in the past we'd be able to go out, go to lunch afterwards, you know, really hang out. Uh -huh. But um, it was still a godsend because I was so happy to be able to talk to these people and see these people. It was, you know, like one of my few anchors to um, a past I didn't know how long it'd take to get back, you know? Yeah. COVID was such an uncertain time. It was like, when's yeah. the vaccine going to be made? How long is it going to be? Is it going to get worse? What if it mutates? It was really like a doom spiral, like scrolling through Twitter on any given day. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it was just, I really enjoyed it, though. Although there was definitely the scramble at the beginning to, like, get the required pieces of technology to film because you can't just like uh grab one of these fancy microphones <laughs> we're recording this podcast on and uh hang it hang it in your closet and hope that it sounds good yeah uh, i had to buy some crazy microphone called like a neumann u87 
mm-hmm. some German, Belgian, Swedish company. <laughs> Apparently, those are studio quality mics, but not even just like normal studio quality, like singer studio quality. Oh, wow. And then I had to pad down a whole room, buy like three um, was it, uh, audio amps, uh-huh. download like multiple different uh, long distance recording softwares like Source Connect, uh, Source Connect Now. And there was a couple other ones I'm blanking on. Maybe it's good that I'm blanking on it. Block out those memories. <laughs> uh, and it was just, it was interesting though. But I, I, I also learned a lot. It was an opportunity to learn how to be an audio engineer. Um, mm-hmm. Because the world, uh, in a sense, will also never recover in a certain way. Working from home for all industries has become like a new sort of standard mm-hmm. for people. Right. And like people can look for jobs that say, I would like to work from home. And there are companies that are offering that. Because yeah. in its own way, it's more efficient. Right, yeah for auditioning more than anything, making actors learn how to be their own engineers in a certain sense from being able to start, stop recordings, edit audio, clip things, and then download into MP, uh, export to MP3 and submit on their own, really streamlines the audition process overall and has actually opened uh, the opportunity for a lot more people to enter the industry, mm. which is great. More yeah. people into the industry, more people exploring their passions. I couldn't be happier in that regard. It, it's It's become a lot more accessible and at the same time, has uh, made it so that people have to learn and educate themselves more. I always believe in bettering one's craft no matter what mm. field you're in. Right. I don't think you should ever really stop because complacency can just like lead to so many problems. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I, 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 there was ups and downs, <laughs> pros and cons. Yeah. Um, this is kind of off topic, but like, are you able to like visualize the characters like when you're like in the mode and yeah, recording? Like, what's your thought process? Like, yeah. Sometimes you're given like actual character drawings and you're able to just like, ah, yes, there it is. Other times it's a little more difficult. I think when I really hit my stride is when I have a good breakdown. Maybe I do or don't have character art, but I can start to picture what this character looks like. Uh I think even the better part is when you do have character art and you can almost like imagine what's happening in the scene. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah when you're doing those lines like oh okay is this character fighting do i need to make extra noise like obviously you have the line but the line is ambiguous it doesn't tell you oh make an effort here sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't Uh and um i've actually gotten jobs off of the fact that i did breaths when i was supposed to be running in a scene or making grunting noises when i'm supposed to be uh fighting or doing arduous movement in a scene you know there's 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 bringing a character life and then there's bringing a character into a mo- into motion right mm-hmm. and becoming a character it's not just about like ah uh, let me put on a mask and play a character i think um that's the first step. I don't think that's the wrong step. I think that's the first step to becoming a good voice actor and actor right. in general, whether it's on camera or otherwise. I think there's then, then, then there's becoming one and the same. And if you're able to imagine vocalizing and what that character is doing in that scene, then you are just as much them as they are you in that kind of sense. Has there ever been a character where like you imagine them in your head while you're doing the voice acting and then you see it and you're like, that's exactly what I thought it was going to look like? Yeah, um, definitely when I was doing uh, my audition for Valentino, there were a couple lines where I'm like, I can see exactly what's going on here. And then when I finally got anime, I'm like, yeah, that's that's like, right on par, right actually. On. And I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> vindication. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how is it like when all like your recordings done? Like, how is the premiere experience like? Like, was there premieres also with, like COVID? So, oh, yeah. Final Fantasy VII didn't exactly have a premiere because it's a dub job. Dub uh-huh. jobs sort of operate differently. Obviously, there's prestige that comes with dubbing a project mm-hmm. like that, but it's much bigger in its home country where it's made. So um. I'm sure there was a lot of more touring for the Japanese voice actors mm-hmm. back home in Japan for the Final Fantasy VII remake. A lot of us just posted saying, it's out on Instagram, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, which I don't mind either. I, I love the project and I'm happy to support in whatever capacity I can, mm-hmm. although I'd love to do panels for it. Um mm-hmm. But for Victor and Valentino, we had like a whole premiere party. It was amazing. One of the happiest memories of my life. Um, We just went to this bar. Uh, I was the only one under 21 there. Everyone was offering me drinks. It was was hilarious. Um, (laughs) Didn't drink any. I'm a good Christian boy. Don't don't get mad at me, Loyola Marymount University. Uh, (laughs) And it it was just... (sighs) Meeting all the storyboard artists, all the directors, the producers, all the CEOs behind it, just to see all the people who were behind this project in Run Room, who believed in it, who supported mm-hmm. in it, who helped brought it to fruition from an idea from one man, Diego Milano, boss man, best buddy, mm-hmm. to to being able to put like m- 
to animate it, put voices on it, and then release it to the world was it was a special experience. That's really cool. Um, do you have any other career plans or aspirations, or is voice acting the end all be all for you? Voice acting is not necessarily the end all be all. Mm -hmm. I definitely hope to one day pitch my own show. If not, at least write a book and then work on pitching a show. Uh -huh. um, definitely want to work a variety of jobs. I kind of maybe want to one day actually move to Japan if I can learn to speak the Japanese language well enough and Ooh. do sub jobs, you know, join that community, that voiceover community. But Is, yeah. Do you know how to do a lot of different accents? Like how many accents can you do? And do you want to demonstrate <laughs> for us? We got the British one already. Uh, British is probably the best. I'm still working on all the other ones. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> the accent's done well versus the accent that I know yeah. uh, is is very, very different. It's pretty much just British. But uh, part of why I'm playing D&D &D so much is to work on uh, developing those accents. Is there, like, classes for, like, each accent? Like, is there classes you can take to learn how these accents or not? There's YouTube videos, which okay. I actually use for a while, but there are actually act accent coaches out there who mm -hmm. are, like, more than just, like, oh, I can teach you how to do a scene well. They're, like, I can teach you how to do a scene in a, a very specific accent well. Dialect coaches, in a sense, but specifically for uh, theatrical accents. Like, like you know, there, there's, a, there's a natural sort of dialect one looks for and then there's the hollywood version of that mm. dialect where it's right. like yeah we want you to sound like that dialect but sometimes that dialect doesn't exactly communicate well and you need subtitles to hear what they're saying so uh -huh. do the hollywood version that's watered down and a little more clear okay so for most voice acting it's a little bit watered down would you say or it's just depends on the project i think it depends on the project i think some projects out there are like as natural as feasible mm -hmm. uh, heck if you were born there and you can do it perfectly then you're the one for the role even if it's a little hard to understand they'll they'll make it a point to just work around it or say screw it watch with subtitles put in yeah. subtitles on the show themselves if they have to but um i'd say sometimes it's a little bit of like a watered down version of the accent where it's mm -hmm. like extremely well articulated because like i i know like I don't, is it Glasgow or something? There's like some some British dialect. It's like very difficult to understand if just uh. spoken in casual tongue. Mm -hmm. And there's like a lot of like special, unique uh, lingo that they use mm -hmm. that's like could make a small dictionary in itself. And I know the watered down version of that is like they have some of the lingo, but uh -huh. only the ones that are the most easy to over articulate and be understood right. and communicated on screen. So like what techniques do you like do to practice? A lot of mouth stretches, like just a... Ow, wow, wow, you know, those, uh, <laughs> you got like Sally sells seashells by the seashore, you know, tongue twisters, just stuff to really warm up, uh, warm up the mouth, uh, you uh -huh. know, like <laughs> 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 warm up the chest and sort of like warm up the throat so you could hit higher pitches or lower pitches. Uh -huh. It's all super weird sounding. Nothing voice actors do is normal. It's it's all strange and eclectic, but that's why I love it so much. Do you ever like just walk around your house and then just be like just, practicing, like, practicing your voices? H house and car, never outside. That, that's that's when uh that's when the police come by and they're like sir are you okay <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk about this um so what would you recommend to someone who wants to get into voice acting i do believe that consuming media is a good part of voice acting um because you're exposed to a lot of accents that are reoccurring commonly on tv obviously british is the most predominant accent besides neutral american or like southern right <laughs> that yeah. appears on tv um you can learn the tones of shows i definitely even think if you never watched a show before but you can like if they t if they rarely tell you exactly what the project is you should go back and watch the show uh -huh. um understanding a show's tone or even understanding like an executive producer or producer or casting director's past projects information gathering is a huge part of um creating characters for voice acting because like, oh, this person casts dramas primarily. So you can assume that you're not going to pull out a cartoony, funny voice to do the project they're asking for. Right. Normally, they'll tell you the tone. They're like, it's a serious, grounded tone. No cartoon voices. But sometimes, you know, there's that little extra step of like, okay, but this person did like sci-fi dramas. So maybe there's a little essence of something strange to it, a little uh, etherealness to it. 
other than that, it's just trying, practicing voices. It doesn't have to sound good the first time you do it. No one sounded good the first time they put on an accent. They had to practice it. Right. had to repeat it multiple times, watch all manners of videos, uh, look at past examples in media of what those accents might have sounded like to see what they can do. It's like no one's like, ah, oh, yes, let me put on a British accent and it sounds so good for the first time I've ever done it. <laughs> no, it sounds funky. It sounds stereotypical. It sounds strange. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know mine did. And if someone isn't, then they're a prodigy and they should find an agent to meet right now and okay. sign up. How long did it take you to perfect your British accent? Years. Years? Years. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we gotta start practicing more. <laughs> but, but, but before I ever could book a job off of it, even though they ended up having me just do neutral American, uh, years, yeah. There, there's a lot of small nuances. Obviously, like there might be year two, your British accent sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. And maybe some fantasy project where Britain doesn't really exist will be like, screw it, you sound fantasy enough. Uh -huh. Come on down with your watered down British accent. Uh -huh. uh, but like other projects, like we want perfect received pronunciation oh. British, which is like movie British accents from like the 60s and 50s. Oh. Is yeah. it ever like hard to hear back like all the recordings you've done? Like, do you like sit there and like listen and you're like, oh my God. There was a time when I was like, I don't want to hear my own voice. So <laughs> you tell me if it's good, but don't play it back for me. <laughs> um, I was super self-conscious about hearing my own takes. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty bad. Uh, even if it wasn't, even if they were like, no, this sounds good. That's why we hired you. I'm like, no, I, yeah. cap. Yeah, sounds I'm bad. Good, I'm good. We're both like it. that too. Like with this podcast, I think like the beginning, we were like, no, we oh, cannot yeah, we listen. We cannot listen to them. <laughs> we it like, okay, so we're gonna break up and like listen to ourselves because we would have to like, obviously like, like check. It yeah, and make stuff. sure it's fine. And we're like, okay, bye, go over there. <laughs> and we're pretty new to yeah. this whole thing, so it was. But I think now we're better about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah so it's it's, it's something it. you slowly get over. It's not something like I mean, maybe someone out there who's starting is like the most confident person in the world, and they think they're their voice is a gift from god to the earth <laughs> so they're able to just listen to themselves back first time no problem but i i myself was like mm, no i don't think i want to yeah. listen to my voice yeah. and it I'm did good, I'm good. much like the accent it took years for me to get over that it was not an immediate hurdle it was like ah yes this will take a while and then i'll feel confident enough to listen to my own voice back so now you're good you can listen to your stuff yeah, well, I, I would certainly hope so by now because I'm doing <laughs> all of my own editing for my audition. So if I can't listen to myself oh. back, then I'm just sending them out into the ether all <laughs> just, blind. Just putting them out there. Do you have any plans after graduation? Uh, plans for the most part just to keep auditioning, keep working on projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I might start like streaming video games. I don't mm, know, as a pastime. Cool. Uh, I'm definitely already going to start writing some uh, some books. I have a couple ideas in mind that I've been workshopping over the years. Can so you share them with us, or uh, no, or like no, a, not quite yet. I'm gonna like keep those vibe. ones to myself. Uh, vibe, I guess, like um, low fantasy modernism. I'm, I'm Ooh, trying to cool. break into the youth adult novel. Uh, mm. I feel like it's been a while since the youth adult novel genre has seen like a real resurgence. After like Hunger Games and Divergence sort of faded off into nothingness, uh -huh. it's sort of just been like a dry spell. I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about the new series of youth adult novels. Yeah, you're for right. like years, I really heard and no one's making any movies off of them anymore. So I can only assume nothing news come out because yeah. the only one that I've seen get any recent media is like Percy Jackson, and we all know that's been done for years. Yeah, that's a older one do you have an idea of what kind of show you would want to pitch in the future i know you mentioned wanting to definitely something a little more gritty show. probably like a like an older teen to young adult mm. um sort of age range mm -hmm. i don't think i have it in me to write like a show for sub 10 years old yeah i think even 13 would be a stretch uh <laughs> But hey, you know what? Versatility is uh, the greatest thing one can practice. So maybe I'll have to try that one day and, uh, I don't know, sell something to Disney Junior. <laughs> yes, but so oh, yeah. have, like a dream like network that you want to work for or like you want to pitch them something. Or, like, I think streaming services more. are definitely the places to be right now. Mm -hmm. I know it seems a little uncertain with them all splitting up and every company starting their own streaming service and yeah. pulling all their stuff off of platforms. Like, oh, God, no, there's Paramount Plus, HBO Max, Hulu, Disney, <laughs> uh, Netflix. Too many, too many. Many. too many too many but like at the same time it's creating like a gap for original content because right. suddenly netflix is losing all the stuff that drew people in because they mm -hmm. want to have their own original platform right and they're like all right well then we need new original content to bring uh -huh. people in and give them a reason to be here on netflix instead of on disney plus or on whoever decides to start the next singular studio-based streaming service <laughs> <laughs> some more streaming services yeah I think they also have like a little more of a, a versatility. 
I keep saying that word. A little more <laughs> variety good. in their willingness to like take on projects that could fit multiple age ranges, not mm-hmm. more adult. Because obviously, when you pitch to certain studios, they're like, "Okay, thank you for this like kind of semi gory, semi adult show, but this is uh, this not. is Nickelodeon Junior." <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> even teen Nickelodeon probably wouldn't put anything out like that. So like it's, super it's crazy. Very dependent on like who you can pitch to and what their uh, portfolio looks like because obviously yeah. certain people are never going to make certain kinds of projects. Which right. is why streaming services are like, we take everything because we have genres that we chop up and like categorize as we receive new projects. So uh-huh. I think those are the best kind of people to pitch to if you're not sure where exactly your show might fit or if you're like stressing over where uh, what studio might be willing to take on your project. So how do you like pitch ideas? You just like show up to their offices or like... I mean, personally, I have never done it myself yet, uh-huh. so I don't know. But what I imagine it's like, is like anything in my industry, which is it's a very relationship-based business. Uh-huh. So I think meeting people is the key to success mm. as much as your own talent and willingness to hone your craft. Because once you meet those people, they're the kind of people who either cast you immediately or like, oh, hey, you're a great voice actor. I know you're a hard worker and you're diligent. You're telling me you're a writer now and you've got a show you want to pitch someone. Well, I know an executive at this studio who would be willing to listen to this Mm. pitch who Uh would probably also be able to get another board of executives to sit in a room with you and hear you out. Uh So it's very much like what I would think, or at least how I would go about it or how I think it's probably done is – I know there's projects though. My 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 boss Diego Milano for Victor and Valentino told me there was some sort of Cartoon Network pilot program where they would be taking on um, storyboard artists to pitch shows in the eventual, oh. and they would give them a chance to make a pilot and post it to their uh, respective channels oh. on YouTube and see how well those pilots did. Oh. It would be like a test text program, right? Because instead of running it on their mainline channel, like oh let me announce this set aside a time slot for it see how many times i'm gonna run it see how many people tune in it's a little more like erratic and not uh, exactly a perfect science right limited sample size on who's awake in what part of the world at that time yeah it's better to just be like okay we got a youtube channel we're gonna announce that it's on this youtube channel and if enough people watch it and show interest in it enough positive comments enough positive enough enough likes to view ratio then we're gonna be like all right this show is worth giving a green light to make a full series. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, what would be like your dream voice acting job? Or have you already had your dream voice acting job? I've had a lot of my bucket list actually, but I guess like a lead protagonist in a video game would be really cool. Um, definitely video games and uh, cartoons, like especially from Cartoon Network, were like the shows and games I would be watching growing up, playing growing up. So if I could be like a lead character in a video game, that would be awesome. But, like, I've already been a protagonist on a Cartoon Network show, so that was actually a major goal of mine. A uh-huh. uh, little voice acting bucket list scratched <laughs> off on that one. Um, just more jobs. <laughs> the dream of every voice actor. Yeah. Um, so you've been doing voice acting for 14 years, correct? Yes. So have you ever, like, felt, um, like, this imposter syndrome, like, this idea of, like, you don't belong, like, in this industry? Or <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the voices in my head. Uh, no, no. I, Like I said, during those dry spells, you feel a little, like, iffy. Like, I was saying I, I felt a little out of place. Like, maybe mm. maybe I don't have it. Maybe I don't have the talent. Maybe those few jobs I've worked were just those lucky cases where I was the perfect fit for the role and I don't have enough vocal variety. But there was a lot of circumstances going on at the time. Mm. I definitely would have said I doubted myself in the moment, but I had never intended to give up. And it wasn't even, like, a matter of sunken cost fallacy. It was that I just loved it too much mm. to say that... Uh. I was willing to let it end. Right. Like the conversation was had many times. Like if you want to stop, you can stop. If it's just making you feel sad, then every time you don't get a job, then we should just stop. I'm like, but no, I don't feel sad. I just feel a little frustrated, but I don't want to stop either. I think, right. I think that'd be pointless. I think I, I know I love this industry and I know that I want to do more jobs, do more work, break into more things and expand my vocal variety. And I don't want to stop. I don't want to give up. I think that, that, that just be, unfair to myself right so would you rather be like known for voicing like so many different characters or just like one character and be like everyone just knows you from that i think variety is the spice of life (laughs) (laughs) i think i'd love to have a bunch of characters under my portfolio but hey if in that journey to voice as many characters as possible one stood out amongst all of them i would not complain okay. if everyone was like i love this character more than any other character you've ever done and this is the only character i'll really remember you for mm-hmm. and if i ever come up to you at a con and ask you to sign something it's only pictures of this character i'd say hey thanks for being a fan 
yeah have you have you met anyone on like on campus that like recognizes your voice or like or, has like, that ever your- happened N- only if i tell them mm-hmm. never right away uh-huh. i mean i i did uh when i when i first came to lmu i like joined a bunch of like group chats and stuff i'm like hey i'm sean i voice act so every now and then i'll have someone walk up like oh you're the voice acting guy i'm like yes yeah, me yeah <laughs> yeah that's me hey are there other voice actors that you've met that go here or no i think you're the only one no i do have some friends who are in the industry who have come here like uh gabriella pastore uh but other than that i think i'm primarily uh she she's done some voice acting as well she was in a resident evil game she played a, a little girl i don't know if she did anything else after that but she's lovely she's super nice uh, super sweet that's really cool but yeah i think i'm probably and if not i haven't met anyone else who is open about it or has talked about it uh-huh but yeah, I think I'm. I haven't met another voice actor on campus. Yeah, the only one here. The soul <laughs> standing Which is alone. Because we're in LA, I feel like there'd yeah. be more maybe of a concentration. It, maybe it's not as easy to like recognize people. Oh, true. Like, For voice acting, it would definitely be a little difficult. If yeah. someone never said what they were until they did the voice and you know the project well enough, even if they did the voice in front of you, you'd be like, oh, that's a great imitation. Oh, cool. <laughs> that was that's fantastic. So cool. You must really love that really love that piece of media then if you're able to do that voice so well. Yeah, like, actually, yeah, actually, I, I do. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for you. Thank, Thank you so oh. much for this is so agreeing fun. to interview with us. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, thank you for listening, watching. <laughs> to all of our <laughs> listeners, our generators. Oh, wait. Do you want to plug your socials? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> sure. You can follow me on Instagram at Sean Ryan Peterson. I spell Sean the correct way. It's S E A N R Y A N. Peter S E N, not S O N. I am also Irish, so Ooh, that's the correct that's way of spelling Peterson. Yeah. You know where to find us for the gen, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. Um, Twitter. Do you have any projects you want to plug? Uh, I'll just replug the one I did at the beginning. Yeah. Apple TV's Interrupting Chicken. It comes out November eighteenth, so two days. Ooh, Yay. exciting! Okay. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you so you much everyone. for listening, everyone. You know where to find us: Twitter, Instagram. Um, TikTok. All the social medias. You know. All of them. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're listening. Google Podcasts. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. We will see you on our next episode. <laughs> Godspeed. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.